So thank you, Peter, first of all, for the kind invitation and that very generous introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to be here preaching to the converted. Uh, it is so good to see so many young people here, many of you under 50. Um, good, we're awake. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you about the West. Uh, as Peter said, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I co-host a political discussion show on YouTube uh, with my friend and colleague Francis Foster, in which we tried to have honest conversations about many of the issues we'll be hearing about today. Uh, and in fact, many of the guests that you uh, will see here today have been on, on the show. Uh, and also, the other thing that many of you probably know about me is I'm originally from Russia, and my wife's Ukrainian. Yeah. So I've been sleeping on the sofa <laughs> for about eight years now. Uh, we'll just get this up because I wanted to quote one of my uh, former countrymen, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who I think many of you will probably know. Now, before I uh, talk about Alexander Solzhenitsyn, I want to make clear I'm not in any way uh, comparing myself to him. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn had a very different life. My parents sent me to uh, boarding school in England. He was in a gul Soviet gulag where he had to endure starvation, dire, brutal punishment and a complete deprivation of his liberty. So at least we have that in common. Um, uh, so one of the things that Alexander Solzhenitsyn talked about was uh, what makes a society successful, what makes a society function well. He said that if a nation's spiritual energies have been exhausted, it will not be saved from collapse by the most perfect government structure or by industrial development. A tree with a rotten core cannot stand. It cannot stand if it has a rotten core. Now, the other thing I would say about Alexander Solzhenitsyn, I think he did make a bit of a mistake because once he got out of the camps and went to the West, he got to America. And he saw that while Western society was great, it was not perfect. And so he began to lecture at various universities and he began to lecture Americans about their society and telling them things that they did not want to hear. Now, I'm not going to make that mistake, that's why I've come to Britain, where you love hearing how terrible you are. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about that instead. I joke, of course, I'm not here to lecture you. I'm here for very different reasons, as Peter mentioned. This is a picture of my wife and I only a few days ago. As you can see, she's pregnant, not me, because we're old school. Um, <laughs> So I'm not here to lecture you as a foreign visitor about your country. I'm here for very personal reasons, for very important reasons. In a few weeks my wife will give birth and we will have a child and if everything goes well we may have another child and if everything goes really well they may have children too. And all of them will live here in the West, just like me. And I want us in our society and for them to live in the prosperity and safety that we all now enjoy. That is why I'm going to tell you some things, let's be honest, that you all know, but also some of them you will not want to hear. So I apologize to you in advance for both of those things. Now, what is it that I want to say? Does anybody know what this is? Very good, sir. It's a wooden plane made out of wooden leaves. In World War II, in the Pacific theater of war, mainly between the United States and Japan, uh, they needed to control the ocean. And to do that, you need naval bases or you need some kind of places where you can drop off supplies. And both the Americans and the Japanese took over a bunch of small islands in the Pacific and they began to drop off weapons, ammunition, medicine, clothing on these islands. And the deal they did with the native tribes that lived there, fairly technologically primitive tribes, is they would share the advances of Western civilization, medicine, clothing, etc., food, tinned food, with the natives. And the quality of their lives improved dramatically in a very short period of time. And then the war ended. And the Americans and the Japanese packed up and took all their medicine and their clothes and their supplies and left. And the quality of lives of the people that lived there dropped massively. So what do you do? Well, think about it from the point of view of the natives. All they saw was these weird shapes come in and land on their island and some soldiers who marched around 
And they thought that the prosperity and the safety and the medicine and the clothing that they enjoyed could be reproduced. How do you reproduce that? Well, what you do is you imitate. You build planes out of wood. You make wooden rifles and you march around with them. You imitate the things that you've seen because you think that is what produces medicine and clothing and prosperity, etc. Right? Now, it's a strange thing, but are we that different now in the West? We talk about all these things. We talk about capitalism, democracy. We talk about freedom and free speech. But are we really committed to those or are we imitating? Take capitalism. What does capitalism mean? Right? Well, capitalism means, to, if you ask an economics professor, they'll tell you capitalism is about a society in which there's a free exchange of goods and services. Right? What does capitalism actually mean to most of us? It means that you have the opportunity to use your talents and your skills to produce things that you share with other people. And if they are value to others, you will be rewarded for this. And we have the understanding that this will be done in a relatively fair system. Right. Do we have a relatively fair system? A system in which multinational corporations pay less tax than Jimmy Carr, while young people have to wait until they're 40 to buy a house? Is that capitalism, the way it was intended? We talk about democracy. At the last presidential election in America, a major newspaper, the oldest newspaper in the United States, published a story about the son of one of the candidates that was unflattering. And the same corporations that don't pay any tax, what did they do? They prevented that story from being shared because it was quote-unquote Russian disinformation. And we know for a fact that if this had been a story about the other candidate's son, that would never have happened. Is that democracy? And we know for a fact, because the research shows it, that many of the people who voted for his father would not have voted for his father had they known about the story. And we now know, of course, that the story is largely true. Right? So is that democracy or are we just imitating? We talk about freedom, but the moment we get scared, we're very happy to give away our rights to the government. Right? And we talk about freedom of speech. And yet, this country arrests thousands of people every year for things that they say on social media. Now, most of you will be familiar with this case, Harry Miller, who tweeted something, a transphobic limerick, apparently, on Twitter. And he had the police call him up and ask him to check his thinking. And when we interviewed him on trigonometry, he said, I've said to, I've said to this police officer, I said, you're a police officer. And he said, yes. And I said, and you're telling me you need to check my thinking. And he said, yes. And he said, do you have any idea what that makes you? Right? Now, one of my great heroes, a big lefty comedian, by the way, George Carlin, he said that political correctness is fascism pretending to be manners. Right? I agree with that. How many of you know where political correctness, the term itself, comes from? One man. Excellent. Comes from the Soviet Union. 1917, the Russian Revolution. And it had nothing ever, political correctness, had nothing ever to do with politeness, with preventing offense, with ensuring that people's feelings were protected. Political correctness had one purpose and one pur purpose only, to enforce the party line of the day. So that people like my ancestors in the Soviet Union would say something that was true and they would be told, well, comrade, this is factually correct, but it's politically incorrect. Why does it matter where it comes from? Well, I'll tell you why it matters. This is a man called George Kennan. He was the, Soviet, um, the US ambassador to the Soviet Union under Harry Truman. And he is the man largely responsible for the policy of containment of the Soviet Union. He influenced decades of American strategic thinking and Western thinking about the Soviet Union, having spent a lot of time there. And this is what he said. He said, we must have the courage and self-confidence to cling to our own methods and conceptions of society. After all, the greatest danger, the greatest danger is that we become like the thing that we're trying to cope with. We become like our enemies. A bad word, enemies, isn't it? It's unpleasant. We don't have enemies anymore, do we? 
do we? Because we're nice people. We like to trade. We like to have peace with others. We have no enemies. We have live in this globalized world, right? And the best thing about it is everyone everywhere in the world thinks exactly like us, right? Right? Now, if I ask you that question, you all know what the answer is, but deep down, we behave like that's true. Is it true? Is it true that we have no enemies? Is it true that everyone everywhere in the world thinks like us? I'm going to introduce you to some of my Russian friends. I'm going to play a video for you in a second, if we could. Uh, don't play it yet. Uh, before I do, I, I want to tell you who the people are that you're about to see. So some of them you will recognize in a second. Um, Vladimir Putin is one of them. Uh, the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, is another. And the other people you see mainly from television are two men in particular called Vladimir Solovyov and Dmitry Kisilov. Now, these are the sort of Piers Morgan and Andrew Neil of the Russian media space. They host the two most popular TV shows in Russia. And I'll remind you, 80% of the Russian public get all of their information from television exclusively. They are not on Twitter. They're not on Twitter, they're not on Facebook, they get the information from this. If you think that we are going to be in Ukraine, think 300 times. Remind you that Ukraine is only a long-term stage in the protection of strategic безопасности Российской Федерации. У нас кончится терпение. Мы просто запустим что-нибудь тяжелое в сторону Вашингтона и Лондона. Польша доиграется. Было три раздела Польши. Четвертый будет последний. Границы России нигде не заканчиваются. Придет время, и Польше ничего не останется. И от Прибалтики. Мне кажется, что государство под названием Литва и государство под названием Польша ведут себя слишком нагло. Слишком нагло. И не понимают еще, так сказать, да, что вот э, на самом деле с ними можно разобраться быстрее, чем с Украиной. Пускай пищат, кричат, да, это бомбардировщики, которые способны нести ядерное оружие, но у нас нет другого выхода. О, наши подлодки способны выпустить более полутысячи ядерных боеголовок, что гарантированно уничтожают США и все страны НАТО в придачу. Это по принципу «Зачем нам мир, если в нем не будет России?» И сейчас вся российская триада переведена в особый режим боевого дежурства. Если мы снова нашу армию подведем к западным границам, они трусливые, они боятся, их нужно брать испугом, кнутом. Мы э, ни в коем случае не можем остановиться на полпути. С такими санкциями, кто сказал, что надо останавливаться вообще в границу Украины? Савер... Например, может выглядеть сценарий по а, собственному захвату Прибалтики. Да и Россия единственная страна в мире, которая реально способна превратить США в радиоактивный пепел. There you go. We have no enemies, right? Now, am I telling you this because I want to scare you? No. I don't think we have anything to be scared of. Uh, just, uh, if you don't know anything about Russian politics, you only need to know one thing. This charming fella who's, who's talking about uh, how uh, Europeans are cowards who need to be conquered with a whip. Uh, he is the leader of the Russian Liberal Democrats. <laughs> I should say former leader. He uh, passed away in a very timely way a couple of weeks ago. His name, is Vlad His name was Vladimir Zhirinovsky. So, am I telling you this to scare you? George Kennan, come back to this. He said, the Soviet Union is impervious to the logic of reason and highly sensitive to the logic of force, right? But here's what he also said. He said, if you make it clear that you are strong, you will not need to use force. If you're confident in who you are and what you stand for, you will never need to have a showdown in which people's egos get involved. And George Kennan is the architect of the Cold War which prevented nuclear war between our two countries, and which prevented the Soviet Union dominating the world, right? Now, you don't believe me, do you? Because uh, I'm a, you know, my wife's Ukrainian. I'm biased on this, right? And George Kennan, he's an evil American imperialist, right? 
Das muss leider mal lernen sein. Stick your banner in. If it's soft, keep going. If you feel steel, pull back. Now, is Lenin relevant? To, he was alive 100 years ago. The Russian Revolution was 100 years ago. Has any of you been, been to Moscow? Did you go to the mausoleum? Where is the mausoleum? Red Square. Where is Red Square? In the heart of the capital of Russia. Huh? Here it is. What does that mean? His body lies there as a reminder to all Russians of our history. Right? Hasn't been buried anywhere. It's in the heart of our capital. What does that mean? Well, look at our country here in the UK. Winston Churchill in Parliament Square down the road from here. Why is he there? Is Winston Churchill there because he was a great man who we love and respect? Sure. But he's not only there for that reason, is he? He's a symbol. The statue is a symbol of defiance in the face of tyranny, of courage in the face of bravery, right? A symbol, as is the act of defacing it, right? The people who did this did not do this to insult Churchill. The people who did this did this because they are demeaning the very things that our country stands for. The very ideals that we hold to be important were defaced. Why is that? Do you think the people who did this want Britain to be great? Right? So what's the answer? What is the answer? Do we fight? I already showed you the answer. We must have courage and self-confidence to cling to our own methods and conceptions of society. That's what Cannon said. Don't have to fight. We don't have to fight. All we have to do is remember who we are. Now look, people on our side of the argument get upset by these words and by the discussion around them. Right? I think that's a mistake. I think that's a mistake because I think these issues are important. I've experienced racism. When I was at school, someone told me to, I quote, go back to Russia, you packy. It's hurtful. I haven't spoken to that teacher since. <laughs> Worst geography teacher ever. Um, <laughs> you will never eradicate racism from the human heart by doing this thing that we now call fighting racism. You will never eradicate racism from the human heart by doing something called anti-racism. But you can and should eradicate racism from the human heart by doing called something, something called embracing the very Western idea that we're all born of equal worth and of equal dignity. It's a Western idea and a very unusual one around the world. What about inequality? Can you eradicate it by chastising people for being successful? I don't know, I don't think you can. But what you can do is make people feel like the society in which they live is fair. And if you do your best and you apply yourself, you will succeed and you will be rewarded. Right? In other words, we have to get the boundaries that are in place that prevent people from succeeding on their own merit out of their way. So people don't feel like the main factor determining whether you as a young person are going to have a good life and have a place to settle down in and buy a property is how rich your parents are, right? And whether they can give you a deposit. And finally, identity. This division that we've seen in the last six years, where we call each other snowflakes and Nazis and all of this other nonsense, that will never heal our society, right? What if we embrace the very Western idea that you're not judged by where you come from or the color of your skin or what's between your legs or who you love. You're judged on your actions and your thoughts and your ideas. What if we did that? Hmm? 
One final thing. I'm not a religious man. But I can't help noticing that every major religion, particularly the Abrahamic ones, and every major spiritual practice, and frankly, every happy person you've ever met, they have one thing in common. They all practice gratitude. They're all grateful for what they have. We are the luckiest people in the history of the world. And if we're grateful for that, and if we remember that, then our children and our grandchildren may as well. Thank you very much.